a little touch to what you're already doing, which is give yourself some little thing to read every week about the sexual revolution, whether it's an article about transgenderism or divorce or something like that. Read it and discuss it. Take an extra 10 minutes on your meeting and educate yourself. And now you are spending time thinking about these issues, preparing yourself to do something about it, and you've got your little list, right? And if so, so those two things, one, read, do the little bit of reading. Do I have it on here? Discuss it, and then, um, and then save time at your meeting for people to talk about whatever's going on that may need your attention. So right now, it's a big thing going on, drag queen story hour. Have you all heard about this? Okay, completely nuts. People are pe people need to be organized at the local level to go deal with their library, right? Or to deal with your school board or whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be something national. In fact, we need people doing stuff at the local level where these things are coming up and being implemented. And th there are a lot of bad people who are very well organized. There's no reason good people can't be organized too. I'm just saying, right? Is there any prohibition on good people being organized? I'm looking at my fathers here. That would be okay. All right, so do you see? It's okay. All right, so we've got stuff that you can use. You know, we've got materials and stuff like that. That's not important. The important thing is that you do something, right? You do something. And then the E, of course, just stands for educate. Educate yourself, because this is all part of the process that you educate and equip yourself. So just add the organizing and education component to the meetings that you're probably, a lot of you are already having. So the final battle, we have heard from Sister Lucia, that the final battle will be over marriage and the family. The final battle between the Lord and the king, kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Whoever works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought against and opposed in every way because this is the decisive issue. When she said that in the 1980s, I think it was, who knew what she was talking about? But now it's completely clear that this is true. So therefore, I do hope that all of you will get involved and stay involved. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, so I've got flyers for the book over here, and I've got little order cards and stuff like that if you're interested in that. So I just thought it, they're sitting over there. So I'm happy to take questions. I'm sure no one has any questions because this is all completely routine and normal, and you just talk about this stuff all the time. And it's kind of boring. Okay, so what's the agenda of the state? The question is, how does the state get involved? The reason you need the state is because this thing cannot s sustain itself. Okay, that's utterly unsustainable. And you can see that particularly with the transgender business. There's no groundswell of demand for transgender bathrooms. That's not coming from ordinary people. That's coming from someplace else. So let's talk about what that someplace else is. Because these are the people who have captured the state for their purposes, right? So there are a couple of levels at which we can look at the state itself. But let's look at the elites who like this, fant this ideology. First of all, it is a fantasy ideology. You must understand that. It is a fantasy ideology. It hates the world as it actually is. So in that respect, it's similar to communism. It's, they're not all communists. Some of them are, but they're not all communists. The point is, the communists thought you could create a prosperous society without any property rights. They thought this was possible. It was a dream. It was beautiful. It looks good on the paper. It looks good on the chalkboard. And evidence doesn't change their mind, right? We, we know this from experience. We see that this is how people are behaving. So you have to understand that the people who are true believers in this thing, that's the way, that's what's going on mentally. 
and I, I actually even call it in the book, I call it a superstition. Because a superstition is something that we believe in spite of the evidence because we like the way it makes us feel. Right? That's what a superstition is. So we believe that contraception will solve all the problems of the world because we like the way that makes us feel. <laughs> That's a convenient kind of, um, kind, kind of belief. So what we have is people who uh, have influence within the media creating the illusion. We have people who have uh, ways in which they're going to make money. And there are, if you looked at the different aspects of the, of the ideologies, there are people making money off of these different parts of it. Like there, a lot of people are making money off of divorce, for example. Um, if we were going to talk more about divorce in particular, uh, and in the book I talk about the fact that whenever people try to have divorce reform, uh, sometimes it makes it through the state legislature. Sometimes it gets close to getting through the state legislature. And the family law bar will swoop in at the end and throw a lot of money on it and crush it. In Arizona, they even got it to pass and they got the, um, they got the governor to veto it. Okay, so the family law bar is making a lot of money off of the law as it is. They like it the way it is, right? And there's a whole industry um, around that. Um, and so they have a vested interest in the thing. So when you start to really analyze it, you will see that each one of these components has people who are benefiting from it. And if they get a grip on the state, uh, you know, this is industry capture theory for those of you who know political science, that's a, that's a thing in Virginia political economy, right? Industry capture theory, uh, people who have an interest in the industry are oftentimes the ones who invest the most in getting it regulated the way they want it to be regulated, so it benefits them, it's not really in the, in the, in the, com in the interest of the common good, it's interest in, the, in the interest of the industry. There are numerous examples of that throughout the different parts of the sexual revolution. So, um, so that I think that's the way it works. It's a kind of interlocking of, of um, powerful foundations and um, people of influence within media and academia and things like that. They maybe don't have a lot of money themselves, but they're, this is how they're choosing to use their influence. And they capture the state. Um, and that's, that's kind of the way it works. Uh, and, and we must not discount this one other motivation. People like the idea of being able to do whatever they want sexually, right? And the richer you are, the easier it is to buy your way out of trouble, right? So when Angelina Jolie gets a divorce, it's good for a press release for her. It gets her publicity. It doesn't hurt her standard of living or her lifestyle. But when a poor person gets divorced or has family breakdown, it can be a complete disaster for them financially, emotionally, and every other way. If you look at what's happening in our culture, that's what you see. You'll see people at the top are kind of doing okay around a lot of these issues. And the further down you go into the socioeconomic ladder, the more difficult and painful uh, family breakdown becomes. And you, you, nobody's asking them what they think, right? Uh, it's, be, it's being generated by you know, the people with their, their fantasy ideology and their wealth. Um, it seems to me that the institutional church would have a great deal of credibility yes. and the ability to preach against this. And so as a monk and a super priest and as lay people, what can we do to be credible as speaking to this? I think it's extremely important that the laity uh, and the and the, the non-bishops, I don't know, there must be a word for that, just the regular clergy. <laughs> What's the word for that? <laughs> Um, you're right that the institutional church has shot itself in the foot completely, you know, that no credibility at all. But we can see now that a lot of those guys don't care about that anyway. They, a lot of these, these are the same guys who would never preach on Humana Vitae, would never show up at a pro-life rally. You know, those, these are the same guys doing this kind of, engaged in the other aspects uh, of, uh, of corrupt behavior. And they're using their position of power and authority within the church. In this respect, it's exactly like Harvey Weinstein and these other people that I'm talking about. A guy like McCarrick had power and authority within the church, which he used for his purposes. And one of his purposes was sex, okay? And it's just as simple as that. It's nasty, but that's just as simple as that. So therefore, it's extremely important that the people in this room speak forthrightly and clearly. And we have two things to say. Number one, we categorically condemn this kind of conduct. 
we, we don't think it's some conspiracy by people who hate the church to make us look bad. That ship has sailed a long time ago. I mean, you know, that's not, in 2002, some people thought that. I don't think any reasonable person can think that today, that that's what's going on. No, there's something real going on there, and our opinion is that it should be exposed, that it's better for the church for all of that to be exposed and for justice to be done, for justice to be done for the victims, right? That's what, that, so that's point one. No apology in that regard. No, no, not, no, no we, we do apologize for what's happening. But the point is we're not, um, we don't want to beat around the bush about that, okay? That we know it's wrong and we want justice. And the second thing that everybody in this room needs to do is we need to be informed about what the church teaches and say, and you know, doggone it, if they had lived up to the church's teaching, none of this would have happened. And we believe in it and we teach it and there are a lot more of us than there are bishops. So sit down and listen, because I got something to tell you, you know? <laughs> and, and the catechism is sound, our documents are sound, you know, and, we, and if, if all of us do that, they can't shut all of us up. This is the one thing we have on our side, okay, is that there are a lot of us. And I, I just think that's absolutely essential. And that's why I spent some time thinking about, well, what can regular people do? Right, I mean, everybody has a vocation. This happens to be my vocation. I know that's not everybody's vocation because how crazy do you have to be to do what I'm doing, you know? But, but everybody has a part to play. Whatever your vocation may be, you have something to contribute to say the church is right. Kids need their parents. You, you know, there's a part in the book, and I, and I said this in another talk. If you look at this whole thing from the perspective of children, I'm, I'm off the top. Did I answer your question? Okay, all right. Okay, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna add this one little thing in here. If you, if you say to yourself, okay, kids are entitled to a relationship with both of their parents. If, that, if you start from that, and now, now let's just reason outward from that. What, what, does, what obligation does that impose on us? Well, it says you only have sex with somebody you're married to, okay? The way for children to have a lifelong relationship with both parents is for both parents to have a lifelong relationship with each other, right? So you make a lifelong plan with somebody that you're gonna cooperate in co-parenting. That plan is the institution formerly known as marriage, right? So you only have sex with the person you're married to. You don't fool around with somebody you're not married to. You get married, you stay married unless somebody does something really awful. You take care of your kids. You leave other people's kids alone, you know, you don't go nosing around in other people's business. And you do not whine, complain, and nag, and make a nuisance of yourself to your spouse so that your spouse can put up with you for a lifetime, okay? Now, in other words, if you do those things, what have we just done? We have recreated Christian sexual ethics. That is traditional Christian sexual ethics including the don't bitch at your spouse part, okay? That was always part of the package, right? So that's not, I'm not gonna say, because I know we got theologians here who know more about that than I do, but I'm just a lowly social science perspective, just thinking logically here, the result of Catholic sexual ethics is kids get to have their parents. That's the, that's the positive good that is being protected by all of those prohibitions, all those things look like we're saying, no, 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 you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. All of those no's are pointing towards a positive yes, which is that kids are entitled to their parents. And parents are entitled to each other, and parents are entitled to, to rights to their own kids. So if you get kicked out of your family for no reason, that's not just. That's not just to the, you know, to the other parent to whom that happens. So. Other questions? I'll try to make short answers instead of going on and on. Well, first of all, a lot of decent people don't like to think of themselves as victims, which is a good thing, actually, right? Because you don't want to wallow in your victimhood. So that's why we sometimes use the term survivor, right? Um, 
And what I find with um, children of divorce is that a lot of times they are, like you say, <clears throat> they're protective of their parents. You know, they don't want you to say anything bad about their parents or whatever. So what I would recommend is that it, while you're in friendship with them, while you're in relationship with them, you just kind of wait for your opportunity. You know, don't, don't stand there and give them a speech <laughs> or put my podcast in their face or something. You know, you don't want to necessarily do that. But there's a moment for that. There's a situation for that. But, but basically, I would recommend that you listen, you, you know, you be in relationship and friendship with them. And when the opportunity comes up that some, something difficult, they're confronting something difficult, that's your opportunity to say, you know, maybe it would have been better if, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and divorce is interesting because it actually, when you start thinking about it, I, I would suggest, by the way, along these lines, that as you educate yourself, and you are all going to educate yourselves, aren't you? Thank you. Okay. What I would recommend is that you choose some area that um, really cries out to you and study it more thoroughly, right? Because, for instance, the children of divorce, there are many subtle uh, little twists and turns to it, you know, so holidays become very difficult. That, that would be a holiday is a very good time, you know, for you to be kind of holding their hand, right? Because a lot of times there's pain over, you know, I wish I was at my dad's house or we're not allowed to go to my mom's house or my dad's boy, my dad's new boyfriend, my dad's new girlfriend, whatever is going to be there and nobody really likes that person. And, you, you know, that's a time. Um, but, but there are many little twists and turns that as you kind of specialize in one area like that, you'll, you'll start to, your antenna will go up and, you know, and, you'll, and you'll start to see uh, where people could use some support. But, don't, but, but you must understand, this is not simply an intellectual matter. I think that's the heart of what you're saying. We're all intellectuals here, right? We're all, we're all up, up here in the head all the time, right? But you have to understand that People are not up here all the time. A lot of times they're down here in the heart and in the gut, and you got to be prepared to go there with them, right? And so you got to you got to set your rational stuff aside. Not that you're going to contradict your rational stuff, but don't blast them with it because they're not going to get it. But you guys knew that already, right? Well, you've had that experience probably like a million times where you have the perfect argument and it doesn't go anywhere, right? <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> <clears throat> Dr. Boris, thank you so much. Um, I know I had to respond to something that you mentioned about what you would do when you have a person who, you know, I want to get someone who's got four times the year practice, but it's not a day that even allows it. Like about a thousand is allowed for the time they can be. And, and I actually kind of like to watch because, you know, we have the style of people on our side. The people that have gone through this stuff, um, everybody here, you're in a great how many of these people know children of divorce? How many of these people have parents that have gone through this? Every <coughs> single person knows multiple people. You have silent hours. And when you have five people that are freaking out, it's amazing how things start to change. And people, they may not say anything at the beginning, but there are a lot of people on our side. And if we get a couple of people that are speaking the truth and, and going at it and then taking the fight back, we can do a lot. And um, Dr. Morris has been uh, just tremendous. I appreciate so much everything that you said um, and in the past as well. And uh, again, this upcoming session, we are going to make another attempt to repeal unilateral no fault divorce. But the interesting thing is, there is not a single religious argument that we're going to be making. Right. We can make that religious argument, but there are legal arguments, constitutional arguments, social arguments. There are arguments upon arguments. I can think of at least twenty arguments that the you know how are they going to kill all of us? <coughs> I think the truth is on our side, and it just comes down to faith. You know, and I like I said, I, I kind of I kind of like the odds. So, all right, Jeff. Just want, if you want to add anything. <laughs> That's a question. That was a yeah. yeah. What was your question? And Dr. Morse, what do you have to say? No, <laughs> your no, question. I, mean, I was wondering if you were because you know no. in an institution that's really talking about the religious aspect. No, no, that's about right. Some of the other aspects. No, that's right. That's right. That's right. I, 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 what I would add to what he said here is that 
when I started out with the Ruth Institute, I always wanted to be making non-religious arguments because I felt like that's what people would hear, that's what people could hear. Over time, I've become convinced that at least at some point we have to uh, talk amongst ourselves forthrightly about the fact that this is a spiritual battle, this is spiritual combat, um, and there is no natural reason to be hopeful, um, and so therefore we have to have supernatural reason to be hopeful. Well, we have to, you know, get Blessed Mother involved and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and and Jesus is our best player. Like, so why are we leaving him on the bench all the time? You know, that's like not <laughs> smart, right? So, <laughs> but but. To, to take what Jeff said and you know work it with that kind of natural law um, secular argument perspective, what you can what you can say is you know look there are all these reasons why this is a better public policy, and by the way the only people who had the sense to figure that out just happened to be all the people of faith. So, what do you conclude, y'all, about your brilliant scientific atheism? I mean, please, you couldn't figure out kids needed their parents, really. You know, I mean, you can sort of stand it on your head, on its head at some point, not necessarily all the time, uh, but, but, but there is a time for a little bit of gloating, which is that we were right all along, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, I think there are a couple more questions, but I'm not sure how long you want to go with, with all that. I'm, I'm good. I, what, when's, my speech to, when's my speech tomorrow morning? Okay, so I'm here. I'm good. Keep going. I don't have to leave till seven. I don't have to leave till seven tomorrow. All right. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Right. Right. Okay, so so Donald Trump, I voted for Donald Trump, but I don't defend Donald Trump. You know what I mean? And and, and Donald Trump is a unique phenomenon at this moment. <laughs> But I mean, the, th uh, the conditions that made someone like him possible are 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 unique. And so, um, I, I was telling Chris on on the way over here, um, I have a unique vocation here to defend the family. I do not get involved in. There's a whole set of things that I just don't get involved in, and Donald Trump is one of them, <laughs> because you could be spending all day long trying to figure him out, or you know, deal with him, or explain him, or condemn him, or what you know, whatever. You could you could spend all your time doing that. And if I did that none of this other stuff would get done. So I basically have made a concerted effort to ignore him. And that some of you maybe can't do that because you have other responsibilities and commitments that mean you have to say something about him. But I get my work done just fine without paying the slightest bit of attention to anything going on inside the Beltway. <laughs> See, that's his vocation. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Right. 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 And the fact that other politicians are just as bad doesn't change that fact at all, actually. I mean, you know, it's actually, that's changing the subject, right? If, if, if your response is, well, he did it too, eh, that's not really much of an answer, you know, so. Which is why we don't want to be saying, well, 
There are just as many child sexual predators in public schools and in other religions as there are in the Catholic Church. Hey, you know what? That might be true, but it's not. It's that's that's not relevant. It's not relevant for us to go there, right? We got we we need to clean our house. We're going to clean our house. End of story. And I can't control Donald Trump. I can't control the political system. I can't I I can't figure it out. You know. So I just don't I have enough to do, you guys? I mean, really. Anyway, sorry. But no, Chris's, Chris's answer is sound, of course. You've got a few hands here, honey. Do you want to give them the microphone? Or are we done? Are we, are we done with microphones? The microphone died? OK. Volume. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, there's a, okay. Yeah, there, there, there wasn't really a light switch, okay? That, that, that there, there were a number of very gradual things taking place. In each one of these three ideologies, I do trace kind of where they started. You know, you can always trace everything back far, and if you want to keep going back, and end up in the Garden of Eden, which is obviously not too helpful. You know, but but in each of these three sections, I have a section on just explaining what the contraceptive ideology is, explaining what the divorce ideology is, more or less what I did tonight. But then I also have a section on how did we get here, and uh, and in each case, the reason I'm doing that is to show that it wasn't a mass movement that created it, but that it was some, somehow or, orchestrated or organized by elites. And the story's a little bit different in each of those cases, but now we've got you know, a kind of interlocking of these ideologies where they're mutually supporting one another, right? And it, it's not exactly the same people in each case, but they're working hand in glove to make it happen. So I would say with the contraceptive ideology, that to me, the, the history of that is extremely interesting. Um, I, I focus on Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965 as kind of the pivotal moment. But what's interesting is that for thir literally 30 years leading up to that, uh, th to that Supreme Court ruling, are you all familiar with that case? That's the, that's the Supreme Court case w which held that no state may have any kind of regulation of contraception use for married couples. And it, most people don't know that. It was just for married couples, that first, that first um, Supreme Court case. But what I didn't realize until I really got into it was literally 30 years, the, that same group of people, uh, the, the forerunners of Planned Parenthood, basically, in Connecticut, came to the state legislature with a proposed bill, let us overturn the Comstock laws. And every year, they got turned down. Every year, you know, year after year after year, <laughs> they went in and tried to get it done in the state legislature. And the interesting thing is why it got turned down. It was the Catholic Church, it was the Catholic priests and bishops who were saying, this is wrong, it's not going to do what you say it's going to do, it's going to lead to a lowering of morals, and they told their people about it, and in Connecticut at that time, Catholic immigrants were poor people. Catholic immigrants were, you know, low down, and the people who were doing this, you know, wanting this um, overturning of the Comstock Law, these were people who were doctors and lawyers and who were from the old families of Connecticut and you know who taught at Yale and who you know so on and so forth and they were the ones who wanted to have no restriction okay and it was the poor people who were writing letters to their congress you know to their state legislature saying no we don't want this no we don't want this because they could see where it was leading it was leading to we're going to send those poor people down to get their tubes tied you know, that's where it was going, and they could see that, th that that's where it was going. So that's a very interesting case. So the, by, by the time 1965 comes around, they've, they've chipped away at that. And also, for some reason, the bishop quit fighting. And I don't, there's a, somebody wants a research project. There's an interesting question. Why did Cardinal Cushing say, eh, we're done with this? I don't know why. Kennedy? You know, some combination of Kennedy being president, and I, I, don't, I don't know what. But, it, but anyway, yeah, there's that, that period of time. It looks like it all happened in the 60s, but there was a lead up. In every case, there was a lead up that started pr about 30 years prior. Um, and without all of that groundwork being done, it couldn't have, it couldn't have taken place. So, yes.
Say, say it louder, please. So, so in, if I understand the correct question correctly, you're asking about kind of the professional classes, um, doctors, attorneys, university professors. Um, that class of people uh, professes to be all in favor of the sexual revolution, and they uh, have kind of defined it. They defend it. They're the ones who write the court briefs, you know, and and bring the cases and all of that. So they're not the richest people necessarily. They don't have the money. But that's who the money goes to, you know, to, to make it happen. The interesting thing about that is that if you look at college-educated people, just take that as your break point, college-educated versus everybody else. College-educated people typically uh, get married before they have their first live birth. Now, God knows how many abortions they've had. But they typically do not have children out of wedlock. And typically, when they get married, they stay married. And so if you look at their statistics, they look like the 1950s. The only different statistic is they get started about 10 years later than Ozzie and Harriet would have gotten started. So they have their first, they get married at age 27 instead of age 20 and you know, that, that kind of stuff. But they're, they're living a very convention, in a sense, a very conventional lifestyle. But at the same time, they're blabbing about how un unimportant it is and insignificant it is and so on and so forth. So, as that gets implemented into the society, the people with fewer resources, the people who don't have professional jobs, uh, when their marriages break down, it is much more costly and much more devastating to them. And the people in these uh, upper classes, they don't get it. They literally, they don't get it. Why? Uh, w why don't these people get married before they have kids? Why don't they all go to college? Well, you know, there's no, there's no real world where everybody's going to go to college. You know, they, they don't get that. So there's a kind of, there's kind of a big disconnect um, in, in that respect. Is that, is that what you wanted to know? Okay. One other point about that is that I do think that um, you, you can look at the economy, the way the economy has been influenced by the contraceptive ideology. And probably a lot of you are aware of this. Maybe you haven't put it this way. But... Delayed childbirth is the price of entering the professions, right? That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much. I see the college girls nodding their heads. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Delayed childbearing, let me say it again. Delayed childbearing is the price of entry into law school, medical school, PhD programs, right? So what does that mean? It means the people who get the highest positions in the society are people who have already made the decision that that's their highest priority. They may have been contracepting until they're 30. They may have had several abortions. They are all in for the sexual revolution, a lot of them. And so that's why, you know, you see your elite newscasters and the people at the top of their game. They're all people who are deeply, deeply committed to the, uh, to the uh, premises of the sexual revolution. That, I think, is a, that's a huge issue. That's a huge problem. And that is why it's very important that college-educated people hear that you guys are going to look different from the person who goes to uh, Harvard Medical School or whatever and who has no compunction about um, ha having perhaps m multiple abortions before she finishes her medical school or whatever it is, you know? So you guys, you guys are going to change what it means to be a college-educated professional. That's very important. Very important that y'all do that. He's looking at me. Mom, he's looking at me. I'm out of control. I'm out of control. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Can't take me anywhere.